Hey everybody, this is Russ from Retro Game Core. Today we're gonna do a review of the Retroid Pocket Flip. This is a clamshell device that I've had for about a week now. And when I first got it, I made an impressions video and it's like 30 minutes long. So if you wanna see just like how I feel about the buttons and the sliders and things like that, my initial impressions video is here on this channel. I'll leave a link down below. In this video here, I really wanna focus on what I've learned over this past week and how I think that this device might be a good fit for you. And honestly, when I first heard about the Retroid Pocket Flip, I wasn't super sold on it. Number one, I'm not a huge clamshell guy in the first place, but all the same, it didn't seem like a huge improvement from the Retroid Pocket 3 Plus, which was one of my favorite devices of last year. And so I came into this review expecting to be underwhelmed altogether. After all, the specs seem to be just about the same. But here's the crazy part. Over the past week or so, I haven't been able to stop playing the Retroid Pocket Flip, way more than any other handheld devices when I first get them. And that was kind of surprising for me. And so in this video here, I'm gonna focus on all the things that I really love about the Retroid Pocket Flip that differentiate it from other handhelds within this sub $200 space. And of course, I'll also talk about some of the ways that I wish this device was a little bit better. But overall, I think that if you are in the market for something with this form factor, you might be pleasantly surprised like I was. Either way, we're gonna cover all that stuff in this video here, and we got a lot to talk about. And so without any further delay, let's go ahead and jump in. Okay, to start, let's go ahead and go over the specs. The CPU is well known at this point. It's a Unisoc T618. And this is the same chip that you will find in other similar devices like the Retroid Pocket 3 Plus or the Ambernic RG405M. This one has four gigabytes of RAM and 128 gigs of internal storage. And the screen is 4.7 inches with a 16 by nine aspect ratio and a resolution of 1334 by 750. So it's a little bit higher resolution than a 720p display. And the battery here is pretty chunky. We have 5,000 milliamp hours, which is gonna give you between six and eight hours of gameplay. In terms of connectivity, we have Wi-Fi up to five gigahertz as well as Bluetooth 5.0. And it does have a micro HDMI port on the top, which can output to 720p. Additionally, this is the first Retroid device that has active cooling, so there is a fan inside, and this is running on Android 11. The pricing is going to be between $159 and $164 plus shipping, depending on which color you choose. Now, in terms of performance, this can play a lot of systems. To start, it can play all the way up to like Dreamcast, Nintendo 64, and PlayStation Portable upscaled with a perfect performance. And we're going to do a bunch of performance testing here later in the video, but I will say that most Sega Saturn games are going to play pretty well, and about half of the catalog for GameCube and PS2 will be relatively playable. For other catalogs like Nintendo 3DS and Nintendo Switch, it's only going to be a handful of games that'll play at full speed, but those that do are a lot of fun. And of course, because it's an Android-based device, it can play a bunch of Android games as well. Now here's a look at the five different color options that we have right now. Personally, I tested the Indigo, Watermelon, and Sport Red colors. Now let's talk a little bit about the size and overall feel of the Retroid Pocket Flip. To start, I do think this is a pocketable device. It's a little on the thick side, but all the same, I don't mind sliding into my pocket. And of course, if you're gonna be wearing tighter pants, you might have a harder time getting it in and out of your pocket. Either way, I do think it is a good overall size. Not only is it easy to get in the pocket, but I don't mind just kind of carrying it around. And I like the fact that it folds up because then it basically becomes its own carrying case. Now, like I mentioned, when you have it closed up, it is on the thick side, especially with those flared shoulder and trigger buttons. And I would say over the past week or so, I've become accustomed to this overall thickness. In fact, I kind of like the chunkiness of it here. It definitely feels like a toy or a gaming device, but I kind of like that with my gaming devices. And so compared to other smaller form factor handheld devices, yes, this is thicker, but I gotta say there's a little bit of charm with that thickness as well. So I think whether or not the thickness is gonna bother you is really gonna come down to personal preference. For me personally, I was surprised to find that I liked how chunky it was. Now, I did a more in-depth comparison of the colors in my previous video, so I'm not gonna repeat that here, but I do wanna make note that the sport red color is very reflective, and this is something I personally didn't really like. But as you'll see here in a minute, my wife ended up not really minding it at all. I also really like the matte coloring on the indigo one right here. I know a lot of people say it reminds them of the Game Boy Advance, but for me, it reminds me of a GameCube. And so I do like the subdued coloring of this model a lot as well. Now, additionally, in my other video, I did a bunch of size breakdowns between different consoles. But in this video here, I'm gonna show you a quick size comparison between other clamshell models. To start, here's the original Nintendo DS. This is the only clamshell I own that's actually thicker than the Retroid Pocket Flip. But I think we should cut the DS some slack. After all, this thing is almost 20 years old at this point. And it's got a slot for an entire Game Boy Advance cartridge as well. For something a little bit more similar in size, here is the new Nintendo 3DS. This is the non-XL version, and as you can see, it's a little bit thinner than the Retroid Pocket Flip. 
So overall, I would say they're about the same size other than those flared trigger buttons on the back. And finally, here's a comparison with the new Nintendo 2DS XL. As you can see, the Nintendo product is quite a bit wider than the other. It's also slimmer than both the 3DS and the Retroid Pocket Flip. And when holding both of these at the same time, the 2DS actually feels much more like a toy than the Retroid Pocket Flip. The 2DS feels a little bit more creaky and just kind of cheap overall, whereas the Retroid Pocket Flip feels really solid. Now, I know a lot of people are concerned about the hinge on the Retroid Pocket Flip, but honestly, I think it's pretty good. It's got a real solid feeling to it, and there's basically no wobble whatsoever. Now, I'm not saying it's unbreakable. Someone could really mess this up if they were careless about it. But all the same, I think with responsible adult use, this is going to be just fine. So yes, overall, I think in terms of just build quality, this clamshell feels really good. It certainly feels sturdier and tighter than the new Nintendo DS XL. In the end, I do think the Retroid Pocket Flip is going to last me for years to come. Now, another concern I had seen from other people is the placement of the shoulder buttons. Essentially, the idea here is that when the device is fully extended like this, there isn't enough room for your index fingers to fit. Now, for me personally, I didn't find this to be an issue at all. In fact, it's something that didn't even come to my mind until I read about it online. Now, I have medium-sized hands. For example, I wear medium-sized gloves. And for me, yes, I can definitely feel the lid when I'm pushing down on the shoulder buttons, but it isn't to the point where it's inhibiting my actual range of motion. Now, if you have larger hands than mine, that's definitely something to take into consideration. But at least for me, I found it to be a perfect fit. And pressing down on these analog triggers is very easy for me as well. And so, at least from my perspective, I had no issue issues here touching these shoulders and triggers, but also keep this in mind if you do have larger hands. Now let's talk a little bit about the software experience, and you've got a few options when it comes to this Android handheld. Number one, Retroid ships what they call the Retroid Launcher, and this is what it looks like here. It's very similar to a Nintendo Switch layout. Now within here, you can add your systems, then point them to your ROMs and emulators, and the process is a little bit tedious, but fairly easy to get through. And I have a starter guide for the Retroid Pocket 3, which is exactly the same experience. However, for me personally, I like to use a special front-end app called Daijisho. And here it's a similar concept where you can navigate through your systems and then you add your ROMs and emulators. However, this one automates a lot of that process and makes it a lot easier to work with, and it's very customizable. For example, the theme I'm using right here is called Pop, and I think it's really good. You could even say that it makes this nice saturated screen really pop. Another thing I like about Daijisho, it does a very good job of scraping all your box art so everything looks really nice to navigate. And it has a handy tab system. For example, within the widgets tab, you can set up shortcuts for your favorite apps, but then also you can browse through all the apps as well as the Android and Daijisho settings in the other tabs. So overall, I think it gives you a very nice seamless experience once you have it set up. Which actually leads me to the first point I want to make about why I'm liking the Retroid Pocket Flip so much. And hear me out, because this one's a little bit weird. After all, I review these devices all the time, and I probably own about a hundred of them altogether. And so here's the thing about this handheld that separates it from the others. For some reason, this is the first Android-based handheld that I've owned that actually feels like a gaming console. And I think there's a lot of factors involved here. Number one is the fact that I spent about a day or two really tuning up Daijisho to make sure that everything was pitch perfect when it came to starting up my emulators and having all those individual settings perfectly tweaked. And so I am able to just kind of browse through all my games and jump in and out of them with ease. And of course, you can set this up with any other Android-based handheld. There's nothing special about that process here. But I think what it was is just the combination of all the different intangibles that come together to make the Retroid Pocket flip. Number one is just the overall idea of having a very well-made clamshell. For starters, when you're playing a device like this, you have the screen up above your hands, and that just feels really comfortable to me. And this has a couple other added benefits. For example, I don't mind playing 4x3 content on a 16x9 screen, and that's because even though it does have black bezels, they don't really get in the way of my gameplay. Instead, it kind of focuses my eye towards the center of the device, and yeah, for some reason I like it better like this. And the other part is just the fact that, you know, when you close it up, it goes to sleep. It's just a really seamless experience. Now, I know what you're thinking. Well, this is almost exactly like the Retroid Pocket 3 Plus. After all, this one has the same chip and the same screen. Not only that, the Retroid Pocket 3 Plus, admittedly, is actually a little bit more comfortable to use. But the thing is, with the Retroid Pocket 3 Plus and other similar Android-based handhelds, I have a really hard time shaking the idea that I'm basically just playing a phone with some controls attached to it. And of course, there's nothing wrong with that feeling. After all, I really love the Retroid Pocket 3 and the Odin Lite. I think around the $200 price point, these are really, really good handhelds as well. But all the same, I can't help having this nagging feeling that I'm just playing on a tablet that has buttons attached to it. Meanwhile, the Retroid Pocket Flip is just kind of its own thing. 
Anytime I pick it up, I immediately think to myself, oh yeah, this is a really nice gaming handheld. And once I have Daijisho and everything else set up, I rarely even remember that I'm using Android in the first place. And for me personally, I think that's where the setup is the best. And of course, it's a little bit ironic, but at the end of the day, that's the best feeling for me. I like using Android as a platform because it makes things like Wi-Fi and Bluetooth very seamless. But all the same, I like it when my gaming handhelds don't feel like an Android device. And among all the different Android devices I've ever used, this is the one that's gotten me closest to that feeling. Now, I'm not trying to sell you on this idea. After all, it does take quite a bit of setup even for me to actually get this up and running. But my point is here that once I took the time and actually set it up correctly, I really, really enjoyed myself. And the nice thing about using Android as a platform is that you do have some variety at your fingertips as well. For example, here's the Sport Red version of the Retroid Pocket Flip. And like I mentioned, my wife kind of took a shine to this shell, no pun intended. And so once I was done setting up my own Retroid Pocket Flip, I decided to gift this one to her. And if you've ever heard me talk about her gaming habits, she basically just plays one game, which is Dr. Mario, and she's amazing at that game. But also, she doesn't really like navigating through a gaming menu. And so for her device, I set it up completely different than mine. Here, I'm using a front end called Console Launcher. This is a super simple front end that you can get on the Google Play Store, and I configured it to have exactly what she needs. For example, up top, you have the time and the battery status. And then on the bottom, I've customized it to have a browser, the settings cog, as well as the Bluetooth connection and the Play Store. Now for my wife's setup, if she wants to play Dr. Mario, all she has to do is just navigate to this little thumbnail. And I have this set up as a shortcut to an app called Lemeroid. And this is a version of RetroArch that'll open up directly into the game. And just like that, she can play Dr. Mario. When she's done playing, she can push down on the clickable L3 and R3 sliders. And that'll bring up a quick menu where she can do things like save or restart the game or quit. And additionally, I set it up with a couple media streaming apps in case she wants to watch something on this device as well. So for example, I maintain a Plex server here in the house so she can access all of our movies and TV shows. And then of course it's set up with her login for Netflix and Disney Plus as well. Now bear in mind the video quality on this device isn't going to be great, it's only a 750p resolution. But honestly, watching movies and TV on this is not half bad. And it's also nice to have a clamshell like this for media consumption. Now she doesn't have to find something to prop up her phone if she wants to watch something. And so I thought this was a really nice and simple gaming solution for somebody who doesn't know anything about gaming in the first place. Anyway, let me know if you're interested in seeing a guide for something like this. I feel like this would be a great setup for like a gift for like a sibling or a parent. Either way, let me know down in the comments below and I'll get to work on it. Now, before we go any further in my testing, I do want to admit that I made a mistake in my last video. And that is, initially I had mentioned that this was a mono speaker here on the back. Well, I was mistaken. This is actually the air intake right here in the center. And it's funny because I had read about that before, but I just had a brain fart when I was making my recording. Either way, yes, this device does have stereo speakers and they're on the edges here of that air intake. And so the idea is that the air will come in here and then go out through the top. Anyway, I just wanted to clear that up that this does have stereo sound. And just to verify, I did take off the back cover of one of my devices. And it's pretty easy to take this off. You just need a torque screwdriver and then something to pry the back open. And so here's a quick look at the guts inside. To start, you can see that the air exhaust is up here on the top. And then of course that air intake in the bottom as well as the two stereo speakers. Now there's a bunch of connectors here for the controller board and the speakers, but I did find it interesting that here on the left, there are other connectors that are not hooked up to anything. So I'm not really sure what's going on here, but that is kind of interesting. Anyway, I'm not gonna tear this down any further. I don't really wanna break my device, but I did wanna show you the insides here, including that really big heat sink right here in the center. And then of course to verify here, yes, we're looking at a 5,000 milliamp hour battery here on the bottom. Okay, with that out of the way, I wanted to do another sound test. I had done one in my impressions video, but I wanted to do one here just in the open air, and this is in an untreated room. And so I'm gonna compare the Retroid Pocket Flip at max volume against the Retroid Pocket 3 Plus and the Odin Lite. So as you can probably clearly hear, the volume is much lower on the Retroid Pocket Flip, and because the speakers are facing backwards, it sounds quite muffled as well. And along those same lines, let's talk about a couple of the things that I wish were a little bit better on the Retroid Pocket Flip. To start, as many people have mentioned, there's a big chunk of empty space right here in the center. And I think a lot of people's first reaction is that they want to see a second screen. And we'll talk about that here in a second, but personally, I think I would rather have one of two different options. 
Number one, I would have greatly preferred to have these speakers right here in the front, or at the very least, I would have liked to have had Android function buttons like back and home right here. Now I should mention one of the nice things about the Retroid Pocket Flip is that it has two programmable buttons right here on the back. But the thing is, these don't really behave like system-wide key codes. For example, when you have an emulator open, you can definitely use this to program specific hotkeys. But when you're not in an emulator and you're just in like an Android homepage, it can change the function of these buttons. For example, with Daijisho, when I press the M2 button, it actually acts as a mouse click. And as far as I can tell, there's no way to program that to not happen. Now the other one on the left, you can actually set that up for something else. For example, I have it set up to search within Daijisho. But my point here is that depending on which app you have open, these buttons will behave differently. And that can be helpful in some regards, but it can also be a nuisance. For example, once I had this all set up, I found that I had to basically memorize what these buttons did depending on what system I was playing. And of course, when you're in the home menu, it's going to behave differently as well. Now there are third party apps you can use to basically reprogram these to be like home and back buttons. But unfortunately I found that those apps can wreak havoc on the other emulators. And so we're kind of stuck between two imperfect solutions. I like the fact that we have these programmable buttons, but all the same, it actually complicates the overall user experience. In the meantime, if we had just had dedicated back and home buttons on the device, we wouldn't have this problem at all. Now regarding the idea of having a second screen, yeah, I can totally see why people want that. But there's a couple things you have to keep in mind. Number one, developing a second screen to work within Android is super complicated. In fact, even the most flagship phone companies are even able to tackle it, and even then, they often don't get it perfect. And then also bear in mind that Retroid is not in charge of the development of the individual emulators. And as far as I know, the only emulators that are set up for two screens are going to be Citra for 3DS and then Drastic for DS. And so I'm not really sure it would have been worth it to have a second screen. Number one, those development costs would have made the device itself cost a lot more. And I think one of the things I like most about the Retroid Pocket Flip is the price, you know, the fact that it's around 160 bucks. Now, if we ever get to the point where something like RetroArch also has a two screen setup, I think that would be really great. But I think it's just a little bit too early to expect a small retro handheld company like this to make a two screen device. Okay, while we're on the subject of things that I wish were designed differently on the Retroid Pocket Flip, let's talk a little bit about the controls. And I touched on this in my impressions video, but I just wanted to mention here that my feelings really haven't changed. For example, with the face buttons, they're using a rubber membrane connection. And on most handhelds, I actually prefer this. I like to have that nice squishy feel. But I think for a clamshell device, I would prefer to have less travel overall. What ends up happening on the Retroid Pocket Flip is that these buttons just feel a little bit too chunky for my tastes. To give you an example, here is the new new Nintendo 3DS. Look at how shallow these buttons are right here. And to press down on them, it's just a very soft click. And there's a couple reasons I like that. Number one, it just gives me that classic Nintendo DS feel, but then also they're so shallow that they can keep the device nice and thin. And like I mentioned before, Retroid has a history of using shallow click buttons. For example, on the Retroid Pocket 3, they have these nice clicky buttons, and I've actually installed them here on my Retroid Pocket 3 Plus, and I made a whole video about that too. Either way, I would have greatly preferred to have these buttons in the Retroid Pocket Flip. I think even a nice middle ground with the Switch Joy-Cons, which also have a soft clickiness and a shallow travel to them, just would have been better. And it's a similar story with the D-pad as well. This has a rubber membrane connection and has a nice chunky retro feel to it. But again, I think that on a clamshell device, I would rather not have this feeling. Now I'm definitely being nitpicky here. After all, both the controls on the face buttons and the D-pad are just fine. And they do have a nice classic feel to them. With the Retroid Pocket 3 and the Retroid Pocket 3 Plus, they had the soft clickiness D-pad that had a nice amount of travel to it too. And I think this would have been a really great fit with the Retroid Pocket Flip too. As another example, the new Nintendo 3DS right here also had very shallow travel. And again, this contributed to having a much thinner device. So in the end, I don't think these are bad buttons. I think that the controls here are just fine. I just think overall it has a chunkier feeling to the controls than it needed to be. And from a practical or a functional perspective, I think they did just fine. For example, here's me playing Celeste, which I consider to be what I call a precision platformer. In this game, it's very important to be able to hit the diagonals when you want and to not hit them when you don't want them. And as you can see from my gameplay right here, it's basically pitch perfect. So if you do like the feel of a mushy kind of gamepad, like a Super Nintendo or something like that, and you want to use that for more modern games, then yeah, this might be a great fit for you. But at least for me personally, I think it could have been done a little bit better. Okay, now let's talk a little bit about these sliders. Now these are magnetic sensors, and so they're not going to develop drift over time, and they are super precise. And I think when it comes to single joystick style gameplay, you know, like an arcade game, yeah, this is a really nice fit. 
I also think it works pretty well when you're using a dual analog stick game where you're not going to be using the right analog stick as much. For example, if you just need it to adjust the camera here and there on a 3D platformer, yeah, that's going to be fine too. However, I found that with a first person shooter setup, it did feel like a compromised experience. Number one, just the overall shallow field of sliders does come into play compared to something like a joystick, but also it just kind of felt a little bit off to try to play a game that I'm just so used to playing with joysticks and then try to put that into sliders. Yeah, it did feel great. And so if you are looking to say, for example, stream like Xbox and PlayStation on a device, I don't think the Retroid Pocket Flip is going to be a good fit when it comes to first person shooters. For games like that, I would rather use something with a twin stick setup, you know, like the Odin Light. This one also has a larger 6 inch screen, which is going to make it great for modern games. After all, these games were made with a television in mind, and so the text can get pretty small. And so the difference between the 6 inch screen here on the Odin versus the 4.7 inch on the Retroid Pocket Flip can be significant in that regard. Okay, and finally, the last thing I don't really like about the Retroid Pocket Flip is the active cooling fan. Now, in the settings, you can either turn the fan off or on, and you also have three different speeds to work with, too. And the balance one is basically going to be a slow speed, performance is going to be max, and then the smart one is basically going to turn it off and on as needed. And while the smart mode might seem like the most ideal choice, I found it to be the most distracting. And that's because the overall whine of the fan itself when it kicks on and turns off is just kind of annoying. And I did an audio test in my previous video, but let's do one again here just using an ambient room mic. And so it's a little bit hard to hear, but when you're actually holding it and using it, you can definitely tell. In fact, it's so annoying that I ended up just turning the fan off overall. But it did get me thinking about what that was going to affect when it came to performance. And so, of course, as you can imagine, I did a bunch of testing. And so here's some benchmark scores with the Retroid Pocket 3 Plus on the far left. And then in the middle, we have the Retroid Pocket Flip, but with the fan turned off. And then finally on the right, we have the Retroid Pocket Flip turned on with maximum fan. The first thing you'll notice is with all three, the score is about the same. Yes, there's a difference of one or two here, but really that doesn't matter. What that means to me, at least using this benchmark test right here, the fan is not providing any additional benefit. However, if we scroll down to the bottom here again with the same devices, you can see here that the fan does keep the device quite a bit cooler. So we're looking at a max temperature of about 39 degrees Celsius with the Retroid Pocket Flip, which is about 4 or 5 degrees cooler than the other two. However, one thing to bear in mind is that 44 degrees Celsius, even at the max temperature here, is actually a pretty good number. That's not very hot. But of course, bear in mind when actually holding the device at max temperature like this, you're going to feel it in your hands. Another thing to note here is that the battery drain between all three is about the same as well. We're looking at a difference here of about 6 to 8 percent at a full load. So here's the way I see it. From a quality of life perspective, I don't like having the fan on because it just takes away from my overall experience. And at least from a performance standpoint, I don't really see a difference between them either. Now, of course, as more people get the Retroid Pocket Flip in their hands, they might see a performance difference, but for me personally, I just wasn't seeing it. And so for all my gameplay testing, which I'll do later here in the video, all this is going to be done with the fan turned off. And before we get into emulation testing, let's talk a little bit about Android gaming. And one of the nice things about the Retroid devices is they have a built-in key mapper. So say you have a game that doesn't actually use controller inputs, you can swipe down from the top and then turn on the floating icon. From there, you can swipe over to the right and then select the key mapper. Once you have this menu up, you can go ahead and drag over some buttons and then assign them to whatever buttons you want on the device. And so with a game like this one here that has these static controls, this is going to be really handy. And of course, Android games that have built-in controller support are going to work great as well. So when it comes down to it, you're going to be able to play most Android games on this device. But of course, the focus of this channel here is retro game emulation. So let's go through and test all those. As always, we'll start with the easy stuff and work our way up. And when it comes to those old school handheld systems, you know, Game Boy, Game Boy Color, Game Boy Advance, yes, these are all going to play just fine. Game Boy and Game Boy Color games are going to run at a 10 by 9 aspect ratio, so they're going to be a little bit boxy. But again, I didn't really mind having those black bars on the sides. Now, Game Boy Advance is a different story. This is a 3 by 2 aspect ratio, and so the black bars here are minimal. And so in particular, this system looks really good on the Retroid Pocket Flip. Now, when it comes to your old school home console systems, you know, things like NES or Genesis and Super Nintendo, again, absolutely no problem here. All these games are going to play at full speed and they look great. And I also found myself really enjoying arcade games on this system too. And a lot of that had to do with those analog sliders. Like, I really do enjoy playing these with something like an arcade game. And so if you want to play some of your classic favorites from back in the day, yeah, they're all going to play great on here and they feel really good too. Now, moving on to our 3D based systems, you're going to see a lot of great performance here as well. For example, with PlayStation, you can upscale this as much as you'd like. 
Personally, I think that a 3x upscale is going to look the best just because of the native resolution on the Retroid Pocket Flip. And even at this upscale, all the games are going to play just great. Moving up from there, Nintendo 64 also plays really well. For this one, I chose to use a 720p upscale. And it's going to be the same thing with Sega Dreamcast. Here I'm using the Redream emulator with a 960p upscale, and yeah, all these games are running great too. And really, this is no surprise since I have tested the T618 chipset over and over again. But of course, among other things, I'm a very thorough tester, so let's keep going with these systems. Up next is PlayStation Portable. For this one, I think that a 3x resolution is best, although there are some games that can work at a 4x resolution, and there's a couple others where you have to drop it down to a 2x. Either way, PlayStation Portable upscaled is going to be completely possible here on the Retro Pocket Flip. Moving up to Sega Saturn, this is one that I prefer to play at the original resolution, and when it comes down to it, most of these games are going to play well. Now the standalone Yabasan Shiro Core that I'm using does have an auto frame skip enabled, and so it's not going to be like 100% pitch perfect cycle accurate Sega Saturn, but all the same, I'm comfortable saying that most Sega Saturn games are going to play at a playable speed. Moving over to other handheld systems, Nintendo DS runs just great here, and this is with a high resolution video upscale. Additionally, the touch screen is going to work here if you want to tap on the screen, and then also you can use these shoulder buttons to toggle between the top and bottom screen if you want to have them full screen instead. It's going to be up to you, but either way, Nintendo DS will be perfectly playable. Now the 3DS is a different story. This one's a lot harder to emulate, and the chip really just can't keep up. However, a lot of 2D based games, things like New Super Mario Bros. 2 or Metroid Samus Returns, in general, all of these games are going to play pretty well. You are going to get a stutters here and there as shaders compile, but the longer you play these games, the better performance will be. However, when you start trying to play 3D based games, something as simple as Mario Kart 7, you are going to get bogged down quite a bit. So for me personally, I would not say that Mario Kart 7, for example, is playable. But if you're just looking to play some lightweight 3DS games, this might work out pretty well. And then of course, the systems that everyone asks about are GameCube and PS2. And the GameCube performance on the Retroid Pocket Flip is, well, pretty good. I'm personally of the opinion that I don't think you should buy this device specifically to play GameCube, because chances are your favorite game might not play at full speed. However, if you're willing to use like the European versions of a lot of these games, which will run at 50 frames per second, and you don't mind jumping between different versions of these emulators to make sure you get the best performance, then you might be surprised to find that many games are going to play really well. For me, I was happy to find that some of my favorite games from the GameCube, you know, like Paper Mario Thousand Year Door or Super Mario Sunshine, these can all play at full speed on this device. So what I would recommend doing is checking out the Retroid Pocket 3 Plus community spreadsheet. In there, people have tested a bunch of games and said what kind of performance they're getting and what settings they recommend. And so while many games won't play at full speed, there are quite a few that will. And I have an entire Retroid Pocket guide on my website, I'll leave a link to it in the video description below. And within there, it has a bunch of other tips and tricks as well as links to that community spreadsheet. Moving over to PlayStation 2, it's going to be very similar performance. Many games will work just fine right out of the box, whereas other ones will require tinkering, and unfortunately some games just won't play at full speed. But if you are looking for certain games, for example, all of the Final Fantasy games work just fine. And there's quite a few others like Destroy All Humans and Ico that are very playable too. And again, all this is documented really well in that spreadsheet. Now for other games, it's going to be kind of hit and miss. Dynasty Warriors is one where you have to use a little bit of underclocking, and even then it's not going to play at full speed all the time. And you're going to see some performance issues with other games as well. For example, with Dragon Quest VIII, this one runs pretty well in the beginning, but once you get further into the game and you have more people in your party and you have a bunch of enemies to fight, yeah, it can get bogged down quite a bit. And then other games like Jack and Daxter and Gran Turismo 4, no matter how much you tweak the settings, you're not really going to get full speed gameplay. So again, like with GameCube, the performance here is going to be hit or miss. I would definitely not recommend this device specifically if you're looking to only play PlayStation 2 and GameCube, but you may be surprised to find which games do play at full speed. Now other systems you can emulate include Nintendo Wii. The performance on this one is going to be worse than it is on GameCube and PS2. However, there are some games that are lightweight and 2D based that are going to play pretty well. For example, New Super Mario Bros. Wii has got a little bit of slowdown, but I still would find this playable. And then finally, although the Skyline emulator has actually ceased development as of yesterday, the final build that they have available does work pretty well on the Retroid Pocket Flip. So there will be a handful of 2D based or lightweight Switch games that can actually play too. Okay, now that we have testing done, let's go ahead and start wrapping things up and talk about what I like and what I don't like about the Retroid Pocket Flip. Number one, I was surprised to find how much I like the form factor. Like I mentioned in the intro, I wasn't a huge clamshell guy before this. And I don't know what it is about this little device, but I've kind of been changing my mind. 
I think there are a couple factors at play. Number one is the high quality of the materials. It's definitely not something I would call like a premium device. It still feels kind of like a toy, but it feels like a really good one at that. And then I also like the fact that it just feels unique. It doesn't feel like a tablet with buttons connected to it. Instead, it actually feels like its own device. And I know that distinction is pretty slight, but all the same, it made a world of difference to me when I was actually playing it over the past week. And finally, as I demonstrated in the testing process, yeah, we have some pretty good performance here as well. Yes, it's not going to be able to play every PS2 and GameCube game, but it is kind of amazing that at this price we can play so many other different systems. Now, of course, there are quite a few things I don't like about the Retro Pocket Flip, so let's go over those real quick as well. Number one, like I showed earlier, some of these design choices just don't make a lot of sense to me. For example, I wish they had used dome switch style buttons instead of the rubber connective ones, and it just doesn't make sense to me why they even included a fan in the first place. In the end, I found that to be more of a distraction than anything. I also think that the audio volume and quality is a little bit below average. And again, a lot of that has to do with the design choice of putting them at the back of the device. And finally, this one isn't a knock against the device itself, but it really is just another iteration of a device they've already released. For me personally, I'm kind of thinking of it like the various Nintendo 3DS devices that were released during its life cycle. Yes, some of them had a different design to them, or maybe a couple different upgrades, but all the same, if you already had a 3DS at home, it made less sense to buy a new one. And that's kind of how things are with the Retroid Pocket Flip. If you're just getting into handhelds and you want something with this form factor, then this one is a no-brainer. In fact, I can wholeheartedly recommend the Retroid Pocket Flip as one of the best devices you can get for under 200 bucks. However, if you already have a Retroid device like the Retroid Pocket 3 Plus, I think there's a lot less incentive to actually buy one of these. And so it's really going to come down to you and what you already own and what's in your budget. If you are looking for a handheld under $200 and you don't have something that already competes with it, then yes, I think the Retroid Pocket Flip is an excellent choice. In addition to having a great form factor and overall feel, this can play basically all the classic systems. And I think here, just the combination of the performance and the form factor and just the overall experience of having this thing in your hands, it really does come together nicely a lot better than most other handhelds on the market. And I think the best way for me to describe the experience of having a Retroid Pocket 3 Plus is that this is one of those upper tier devices. By that I mean it's one of those rare handhelds where I feel like if I bought this one here and didn't know anything else about any other handhelds, I would be satisfied for years to come. And there are very few devices that I hold in that regard. That's going to include things like the Steam Deck and the Odin and maybe the PS Vita. In the end, that's a very short list, and I would say that the Retroid Pocket Flip has joined those ranks. So yes, if you hadn't figured it out already, I'm a big fan of the Retroid Pocket Flip. In fact, I just can't stop playing this little device. And I think if you are in the market for one of these devices and you decide to pick it up, I think you'll be pleasantly surprised. Anyway, let me know what you think in the comments below. Are you thinking about getting the Retroid Pocket Flip, or do you already have something very similar, or are you waiting for something else? As always, thank you for watching, and be sure to like and subscribe if you found this helpful. And we will see you next time. Happy gaming.